Hey, everybody out there. Uh, welcome to the webinar. So glad that you could join us during this Holy Week. Hi, this is John with the Christian Outreach Office. I'm joined here with Sarah tonight. And we are really excited to be able to talk to you about discipleship. It's a great need in the church. It is a great need uh, for the uh, for young people today to be taught and led into a deeper relationship with Christ that will last them from their teen years into eternity. And that is our hope. That is our prayer. And I want to start just by thanking everyone who's here and your commitment to the young church, your commitment to student conferences, and your commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. So let us begin with a prayer and just ask the Lord to bless this time because I really feel like, you know, this is such a, a, a topic that I'm very passionate about. I loved it. And I just love being able to talk to you about it tonight. Um, and But I know that my words are not enough. God's grace has got to be the thing that works in our hearts so that we can really be the kind of people God needs us to be to make disciples in the church today. So let us pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this evening uh, during this most holy week as we prepare our hearts to go through and reflect upon and be touched once again by your passion and resurrection. And Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, for choosing the cross on our behalf, for paying the price that we could never repay, for paying the price for the sin of the entire world upon that cross with your most precious blood. And we ask, Lord, that through our union with you, that we would come to know you more deeply in our sufferings, but also that we would come to know a deeper outpouring of your joy as we move into Easter this year. I thank you for the young church that we serve, Lord God. And we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we would be disciple makers for your kingdom, that through our humble and sometimes just <clears throat> fragile gifts of faith, uh, that you would be able to bless it and, and strengthen it and use it to do your will. I just thank you, Lord God, for uh, your never-ending love and mercy. Thank you for the call that you put on it each of our own lives to live as disciples. Just be with us now and uh, walk with us during these next few minutes as we unpack discipleship a little bit and, and talk about how we can build your kingdom for the salvation of the souls we serve and for the glorification of your most holy name, Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. All right, well, once again, welcome everybody to the webinar. My name is John. Uh, all of you, I work here in the Christian Outreach Office at Francis University and I have for the past 13 years. Uh, prior to that, I was a youth minister in parishes in Texas and North Carolina. And um, I spent two years in that uh, missionary and have been involved in various uh, outreaches and conferences and, and whatnot on the parish level, regional and national. But uh, honestly, where my greatest passion right now is just working with leaders like yourself and uh, helping to strengthen you to do what God has called you to do. Um, you know, just to let you know, uh, in this uh, webinar at any time, um, well, actually, before I get into that, I'm not alone tonight, and I'm really glad for that. I'm joined by another awesome member of the Christian Outreach team, Sarah Bacchus. Sarah, why don't you just tell people a little about your role here in the office and uh, and what you uh, how you how you're doing tonight? How's that? Good. Right, that sounds good. So I'm Sarah, and I'm the manager of youth programming here in the office. I've been here just under three years, um, and it's been an, a wonderful opportunity to be a part of these conferences. And my primary role is to um, work on the programming, the theme, and the schedule with a group of wonderful people uh, to really pray and discern what God's calling us to do in the programming. And I also oversee Franciscan Lead, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this webinar. Um, and the conferences have been a huge blessing to me in my life. I went as a high school student and had a wonderful experience there. Um, to really further my conversion relationship with Christ. So it's a blessing to be a part of it in this way. And I'm doing great tonight. It's good to have you all here. <laughs> I first met Sarah, uh, gosh, it was, what, over 10 years ago now, when uh, we first started the lead program, and, and I was the, the lead, uh, one of the lead directors, and you were one of the facilitators on my team. And I, and I was, uh, and I think I shared this with you after the end of your first week, how impressed I was by your ability to share the faith and just your passion for the Lord. And it is funny how God has come full circle and brought you back to the office a few years ago and just been able to work with her on this level. You know, it, she's a real blessing to this office and uh, a real blessing to uh, everything that she, she does for us. So, uh, you know, she's going to be a blessing to this, uh, this webinar as well. Um, yeah, walking with teens in discipleship is it, it, it's very key because you know, I think I think oftentimes when we start talking uh, about um, discipling young people, uh, it, we realize that it's such an overwhelming task, and yet it doesn't have to be. You know, it, it is a challenging task. It is the Great Commission, 
Um, and, and, and so as we talk to, uh, about uh, what discipleship is tonight, you know, I want to be able to, and Sarah wants to be able to, with me, respond to any questions that you might have. Now, in you, on the side of your uh, screen, you probably have the uh, Go to Webinar Controls panel, and one of the tabs as you go down says questions. And all you have to do anytime you have a question about anything that we're talking about is type your question in, hit enter, it'll pop up on our screens. We'll be able to respond to it within the webinar. We'll repeat the question out loud so that everyone can understand what the question is being asked. So we want this to be interactive. It's not going to be distracting. It's not going to be a burden for you to, to, to be asking as many questions as you need to ask as we go along. All right. So, um, you know, <clears throat> okay. Walking with teens and discipleship. You know, I mean, one of the things that, that, that I've kind of come to, to grips with, and, I, and it wasn't really always my view of ministry. When I, when I got first into youth ministry many years ago, it was about let's get as many kids into the room as possible, put on this great program, and get them excited for their faith. And I realized, you know, after a few years of doing that, that we were reaching a lot of young people, but not really impacting their lives the way I think Christ would want us to. And we're called not just to go and uh, build programs. You know, I think that's the great challenge. We sometimes substitute the great commission of go make disciples with go build a youth ministry program that's really big and exciting and fun. And you know, when we do, uh, when we miss the focus, oftentimes the real work of discipleship uh, it, it kind of falls through the cracks or it isn't given the, the amount of attention that it needs to be. So whether you've tried discipleship and you haven't done it well or you've never tried it and you're concerned about it or whether you've been discipling for years and you just want to uh, you know, spend a little time uh, hearing some other views to kind of maybe strengthen your game, I think you're going to, everyone in, in, in any of those categories is going to find something to, uh, to uh, learn uh, through this webinar. You know, discipleship itself, you know, is a process where we accompany, where we mentor, and we walk with young people as they learn to become more like Jesus Christ. And I think oftentimes we're looking for, uh, send me a package, send me a program on, on how to disciple, but discipleship really isn't a program. It really isn't a package. It's about people. It's about you as a minister taking the time to uh, make Christ incarnate in the life of a young person in a way that they can see your living witness. And in that relationship that you build that's built upon trust, uh, that's built on authenticity, you know, they will begin to walk with you and imitate you as you imitate Christ. And I think uh, the, the old adage is true. The only people that can truly disciple another Catholic is a Catholic disciple. Because it is something that's caught. It's not taught. And, you know, sometimes you can teach something that you're not really fond of. And I think uh, some math teachers do this all the time. You know, they're, not, they're not really thrilled with math, but they've decided to be a math teacher. And you can always tell a, a, a math teacher who loves math versus a math teacher who didn't, doesn't love math. When I was a freshman in high school, I failed algebra. I, I, I was a straight C student for the first three uh, uh, quarters or uh, periods in my semester. And when I took the semester exam, I failed it. And I thought I was the worst math student ever. And I thought I could never learn math. And then the next year I had geometry with this teacher who was just passionate about geometry. I mean, like, he was a real nerd. And uh, I, I appreciated his nerdiness and passion for geometry. And I aced his class. And it really was a kind of a... Um, kind of a shift in my mind is like, you know, as we teach young people from whatever we want to teach young people, whether it's math or how to follow Jesus, when we have an authentic passion from, for that in our own lives, it comes through in the way that we work with people. But there is, you know, a path that we can follow. You know, discipleship is not just, okay, let's grab a few teens and blindly walk into the, the, to the jungle of discipleship and try to find our way through it. There are some really key moments and stages that we all need to be aware of in the discipleship process, all right? You know, the first thing that you need to do in order to, to be in a discipleship relationship with a teen is be in a relationship with a teen. So I'd say the first step, the, the first stage of the framework of working into discipleship is just living uh, out your faith and being a living witness. Why is witness so important? Well, if you look at the young people we serve today. They have lost, in many ways, complete faith in any institution. They don't trust government. I mean, they don't trust... Uh, they don't trust religion. And if you look at the, you know, the political landscape, you know, that kind of thought process, this lack of trust in institutions, it's what's given rise to someone like Donald Trump, who's kind of filling this void in, in, 
People don't want to admit that, but it's really a, a lack of faith in government that has led to the rise of Donald Trump. And uh, you know, in in the in the same way, when young people don't see an authentic witness, uh, the living out of somebody who says what they believe and then follows that up with authentic living, then what they begin to do is doubt what the institution that we stand for is. So if we say to a young person, this is what the church teaches, in many cases, young people will actually shut down. Like they don't want to hear the authoritative word on how they should live their lives. But what they are hungry for is someone who will get to know them, kind of get enmeshed in the mess of their lives and give them the hope that they can change, that it will build a relationship with them and walk with them even when they are not being good Catholics even when they are failing as young Catholics to live out the gospel in fullness, and will still love them and witness to the love of Christ. And so that primary witness, that first witness that we give is absolutely essential to the discipleship process. Young people won't care about how much you know about the faith until they know how much you care about them. And so, you know, I, I think I was... You know, a little, you know, at first I was a little frustrated when Pope Francis came to America because I kept throwing him to say, like, start to preaching the truth and start really saying what the church needs to hear. That like we need to, to come back to God and we need to just, you know, to, to be more Catholic and more Orthodox in our approach. And I realized if he had started that way, he would have had my attention and he probably would have had every other person who's already in the fold, so to speak, they would, he would have had their attention as well. What he wouldn't have had is the attention of the world outside the church. Because the world outside the church, it won't care if the church is true until they know the church is good. And so I think Pope Francis came to the United States to show the world, to show the church in America, and to show people outside of the church that the Catholic Church is good, and we have, we have a heart for those people that have been marginalized, and that we really do bring the love of Christ to people who may have already been or experienced rejection in their lives. So that initial witness is the first step, and that happens in the context of just bringing young people together at your parishes. Um, you know, Sarah, did you do you have anything that you want to add to that phase in terms of uh, relationship building? Um. I don't think so. I mean, like John said, the just when people, when teens see the way that you love them and are, you're living your life, especially other teens, um, possibly in your youth group that are already on their journey, it's a huge inspiration. And when you talk to them and um, ask them what impacted them, a lot of times they'll mention someone in their life um, that was that initial spark and encounter with them. Like, how did you follow Jesus or how did you come to know them? A lot of them will pinpoint someone, whether it be a family member, youth minister, classmate um, that really set them on the journey, so. Yep. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I, I've been teaching youth ministry courses here on campus, and uh, I've always asked the, um, I've always asked the young people, you know, that are in my class, you know, uh, what, what was your youth ministry ex experience about? What made the difference? And, and, and inevitably, it never comes back to, well, my youth minister, he taught me or she taught me all these amazing things. They talk about the love this person had. They talk about the uh, the investment that these people made uh, in their lives, in time, and just presence. And I want to encourage everyone. That's really the game changer. If you want to disciple, it's just be a good friend in Christ. Um, you know, the next two phases, you know, uh, or stages in the uh, process of, of leading kids into disciples should have to do with evangelization. And the first is proclaiming the gospel. You know, young people oftentimes, and I know this was my case growing up, I didn't really hear a solid presentation of the gospel in a way that I could relate to until I was a junior in high school. And I, I, you kind of just, I think we mostly assume that by sitting in church every Sunday through some, some, some sort of osmotic process, young people are going to be um, converted. You know, young people are going to come to know Jesus. And, and, and the truth is, you can sit in the church as many hours of the day that you have available, and that won't necessarily make a difference until you hear the gospel and make a decision on it. You know, love in its essence is a choice, and what we're called to do is to love Christ with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, and whole strength. And young people need to be invited to do that. Um, you know, the invitation that goes forth is, you know, come follow me. And come follow me from Christ is not so much a, a you know, like at a distance. It's come follow me, be with me. 
You know, the way Jesus' followers were with him, we're, we're not following him 10 feet behind. They walked with him. They dined with him. They rested with him. You know, they spoke with him. They communed with God as friends. Uh, and, and, and so the call to come follow Christ is one that we need to, to invite young people to do. And, you know, we need to, to understand that part of that is proclaiming the, what we call the kerygma. The kerygma is that core, that kernel of faith that is the heart of the gospel, which is really what Holy Week is all about. You know, it can be summed up in this. God created us to be in communion with him. And through our choice, through the sin of man, we experience separation from God. And yet God did not leave us to die in our sin. At the appropriate time, he sent his only son into the world to be a sacrifice that would pay the price, that would bridge the gap that existed between us and God so we could be in relationship with him. And that through uh our confession of faith through our belief in Christ, we can come to know his love and share in not only his, his death, but rising to new life, eternal life and with Christ in heaven. You know, so the bids are clearly you know, proclaim that you know, this, the core of the gospel is we are called to be in communion with Christ through a personal relationship. And of course, you know, that, that is expressed most fully in communion. And this is why youth groups have such a great opportunity to be a place where young people can discover for themselves the love of Christ and make a commitment to it. But it's also something that I think we do, do really well. We proclaim the gospel really well at our, our, um, at our conferences. As a matter of fact, I think the core of what we do is found in stage two and the next stage, which is stage three, which is leading them to conversion. You know, I can clearly look at my life and say when I was 18 years old, I made a decision that I was going to follow Jesus. And I would say prior to that, that if, if I had to say what my posture towards God would be, it would have been like this. I had my back to God. You know, and then when I made this decision, I turned to Christ. I said, Christ, I want you in my life. And that's what we're asking kids to do is to turn from the world, turn from all the temptations and all the sin in the world and come back to Christ. And uh, Sarah's going to share a little bit more about how we do that at conferences. Because I think, you know, if you're on this webinar, you're probably planning to bring young people to one of our conferences this summer. And, you know, how do we prepare them and how can we make the most of this moment of hearing the gospel and accepting the gospel in a moment of conversion? So, Sarah, why don't you share with everyone a little bit about the, the, the conference weekend and how this can help in this portion of the discipleship process? Sure. Um, so starting with one of the first things John talked about with witness, um, you know, I think a powerful witness is seeing a couple of teens coming together for a weekend for the same reason, whether or not they're a hundred percent there for all the right reasons, you know, maybe a friend invited them and they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. However, when you get there and you see a couple thousand teens, um, singing and dancing and having fun and then really entering into prayer, uh, throughout the weekend. It's a powerful witness. Um, all of our presenters from the stage, we really emphasize to them to really share their witness, to share their story about how God worked in their life. And so the teens are able to hear and see from the stage a witness of someone striving to follow Christ as a disciple. And then also the witness of everyone they came with. Uh, you as a group leader, um, chaperones, um, to really, it's a weekend away to really see um, and experience the witness of others and those around them. And then as John mentioned, the heart of our, the goal of our conferences is to make the love of Christ known. And we do that through the sacraments, through their encounter with Christ in the Mass and Eucharistic Adoration, through prayer, again, through the different keynotes and talks that are on the weekend. Um, and all of this is really to set them up to encounter Christ in some way um, and to have that initial conversion experience, to know Christ in a new way and to make a decision in their life. I want to follow him and... Um, and move forward in that. A, a powerful moment of our conference is Saturday night. Um, after we've gone through the weekend, having some of those things I mentioned, having mass, Eucharistic adoration, um, the host of the weekend will invite the teens to stand up and commit their life to Christ if they feel called. And almost all of the teens stand, um, and they lead them in a prayer to really give over their life to Christ. And that's the beginning of their journey. Now, that isn't, um, you know, their entire walk as a disciple, but that's that initial conversion desire to turn, like John mentioned, turn toward Christ instead of away. Um, and then it's the launch pad for a life as a disciple. Um, and all of the talks, though, every year there might be a different theme and slightly different content and keynotes and schedule. The heart is the gospel proclamation, like John mentioned. We really want to preach the love of Christ um, and what he's done for them, just 
as John mentioned, a basic charisma uh, that Christ loves them. He died for them and wants to be in a relationship with them. And so those shared in different ways by different people. That's the heart of the content of our conferences. Um, on Sunday, um, we try to wrap up the weekend and really send them forth to, uh, to be rooted in everything they experienced on the weekend, really encouraging them to have a life of prayer, to surround themselves with people that will call them on uh, to holiness and to encourage them in the right things instead of pulling them away from God and uh, again, encouraging them in that. And so you all play a tremendous role though in their walk um, in discipleship with Christ because we provide them that in place of initial encounter and experience, um, but you are so blessed to be able to walk with them every day from the conference. And so um, kind of backtracking, it's so important we talked, um, we did a webinar earlier last month about how to prepare for the conferences. And so, um, you know, just a reminder, a huge part of, of that witness and initial conversion on the conference weekend is the relationships that you're able to build with them prior. Um, and then post-conference, after the conference, having a plan with how are you going to follow up with them? How are you going to help them in this walk? A lot of teens will leave our conferences on a quote-unquote retreat high, which you may have heard them say many times. I've heard teens say, I need to go back to Steubenville to get that back, to experience that feeling again. And they're very focused on feelings, which teens are emotional people, and God gives us that gift of his experience and that um, love and joy and peace that they might feel on the conference weekend. But as you know, it's that's not the everyday experience that they'll have. So it's really important that they have someone like you um, and your other chaperones and maybe other people on your core team to, to walk with them and show them what does it mean. They had this incredible experience and encounter with Christ, but what does it mean to live it out every single day in a life of prayer, even when they're not feeling it, even when they don't have those emotions um, and aren't super excited? How can they still be faithful to Jesus and walk in their life of prayer and the choices that they make every day? And so um, it's really key to have that plan of how you can continue to walk with them. And again, I, you can't do it alone. Uh, to really empower your chaperones or perhaps other leaders uh, in your youth group teams who are on their walk with Christ uh, to be that witness and to be that guide with them. And also, that reminded me, just want to mention too, you might have teams that we're talking about initial conversion and all of that. You might have teams coming to the youth conference that are on their journey with Christ. Maybe they've come and they've had that experience and they're faithful and uh, still on fire for the Lord. Um, but the beautiful part of the conference is there's always an opportunity for deeper conversion, uh, maybe a truth to take deeper root in their heart. Um, I know for me as an adult working the conferences, I'll hear something that a speaker says or have an encounter with Christ during adoration, even though I'm working the conference, that uh, brings me closer to him. So there's opportunities for those teens to uh, reap life to Christ and to have the, the truth of his love um, take deeper root in their heart and also serve as a witness. So um, it's not a one and done deal. So even those teens in your group that maybe have had that initial conversion uh, can still encounter Christ in a new way. So yeah, so John, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. We can jump into the, the plan for post too. And if you have any questions, just a reminder, you can, you can type them into your box too as we go. Yeah, I, I just want to, you know, say well, that was great, Sarah. I think, you know, it, you know, one of the things, you know, my first experience with student was not as a high school student. I did not have the opportunity to go as a high school student to a student conference, but uh, I first brought uh, young people when I was a youth minister. And one of the things that I was committed to doing as a youth minister was the ongoing evangelization of my team. So I would do a retreat in the fall. We would do a retreat in the spring. We would always have as part of that a chance for them to once again respond to the gospel. But nothing, nothing was as powerful in the lives of my young people as taking them to a conference because there's something beautiful, uh, a grace-filled moment when you're in a room with 2,000 other young people there to experience the love of Jesus Christ and you see the faith of all your peers around you. People are, are giving their hearts to Christ in this moment of prayer and, and it just it, it inspires and it draws even the hardest nuts to crack. I always knew that if I had a young person who was a, a tough nut to crack, I just needed to get them to Steubenville because even if God didn't break through all the way, something would happen that would leave them ready for more evangelization or even ready for discipleship. You know, God, God has done miracles in the lives of thousands of teens and he does it every summer. We see this, you know, there, I, I have friends who, you know, and Sarah's one of them, uh, at a student conference where they first have their initial conversion, who've gone on to do amazing things in the church, uh, you know, serving and leading others to Christ. 
And the beauty of it for me as a youth minister is, and when you're running your own program, right, you get so caught up in the logistics and making sure everything behind the scenes is, is running well that sometimes you can be so overwhelmed that you don't have time to actually minister to your teens on this retreat. And at Stigma, you just come and you just be with your teens. You, know, you just walk with them together on this journey. You don't have to lead anything. You're not in charge of anything. You're just there to pray and to witness and to love them. And all of the effort is being done by an amazing team of speakers and, and our partners at every one of our conferences across the country. You know, they just do a great job of creating an environment where you can just be a minister and a witness and help guide your young people as they experience the love of Christ, if not for the first time, in, in a new way. As, you know, and and it's, a be- it's beautiful to see the lasting fruit of that encounter in the lives of young people. But I would say one of the dangers, and, and, and Sarah alluded to this too, actually talking about the young people who come back and say, oh, I need to go back. I need to go back to studio because that's where I can find Jesus. And I think this is where we understand that the most important ministers in the room at a studio conference aren't on the stage. They're sitting in the seats with the young people. That's you and your and, and your team, your chaperones with you as a group leader. If you are a chaperone, you're know, like your presence there is more important than any other person's presence there because you're the one who's going to be walking with these teens after the conference is over when they're going to need a helper to pick them up the first time after they fall. After that high is worn off and they're like, where's God? You'll be able to show them this is where God is. You'll be able to help them stay connected because you got to believe you know, when Jesus tells the parable of the, of, the, of the path and how he's out there sowing seeds and some of it falls on the path where it's trampled and other falls amongst rocks where it can't find root and others find, you know, fall amongst the thorns you know, and where it's choked off. And young people, the heart of their soil can be in very different places. Some people might have a lot of weeds. Some people might be more rocky. And so the, the word of God falls upon their heart and they respond. But it's up to you to nurture that young plant, that young faith. Make sure that the soil is rich. Make sure that it's being nourished with prayer and the sacraments and the grace that it needs to flourish. And, and, and walking with teens and making that happen is key to the discipleship process. And that starts, like Sarah alluded to, with having an idea of what you want to see happen and, and, and forming a plan to make that happen and creating an environment within your youth group to help make that happen. So Sarah's going to talk a little bit about you know, coming out of a conference, what kind of things can we do? Um, so, you know, very simply, um, bringing back the same, the group together and, you know, the small groups are a huge part of the conference weekend. And so I think it'd be really important to, um, post conference to get those groups back together again, uh, to be able to share and process what God has done. Perhaps there's time for that on the bus ride home or things like that. But even after a week or two, it would be good to get back together because again, this is when we start to see, um, the, them tapering in their experience, perhaps being discouraged or like John mentioned, falling away or going back to a sin that they really resolved to turn away from at the conference and being discouraged and disappointed. Um, and so it's really important to bring them back together to hear them, hear where they're at and really offer that encouragement um, and maybe share more in witness to your life about how uh, you've um, gotten back up when you've fallen or have, um, you know, been able to keep on your journey with Christ, uh, even when you're not feeling it or when it's difficult or you're busy, all these things is when teens are away, um, on the conference weekend, it's really easy for them to pray and to focus on Christ. But then teens were finding more and more just so busy and so caught up in school and sports and extracurriculars and social media and all these things. And they're bombarded. Whereas on the conference weekend, away, um, and we have their time and attention where they can really encounter God. But what does it mean for them to live that every day and to really talk through some of those things that might be challenging for them um, to remind them of the things that they experience on the conference weekends of, of prayer and silence and uh, community uh, to really remind them what the key parts are and how they can live that out every day. So that'd be the first thing I'd say. Yes. You know, because it, it's important to remember. And, and I think if you talk to anyone on our team, you know, you're going to hear this from just from everybody in our office. You know, we're not here to put on conferences. That's not our mission. Our mission is not to build the biggest and the best conferences. We want to do that, but it only only because it serves our mission of wanting to build the church. 
And Jesus said, go make disciples. So we see within this discipleship process, you know, the witness, the proclamation, and inviting people to conversion. That is the area of this process where we're the most effective and where our conference outreach, I think, really has been gifted by God to, to help build the church. But the majority of the work, the tougher work in discipleship falls upon you and working long term with the teens when they get back to uh, their parish. And, and, and what you're doing is absolutely essential. You know, and I think I already said this, but you know, it's only going to happen in relationship. And this is why you know, gathering the young people together, building that community, asking them how their lives are going. How's your prayer life? How's everything going in your relationship with Jesus? Talking to them about that. And you have to have a level of trust in order to get there. And so these things take time. You can't, you can't just say to a young person, come into the room, and right away I'm just going to say, all right, listen to me. I want to tell you how to be a disciple. What, you need, what, what the first movement is, who, what's going on in your life, and how can I help you grow closer to Christ? Because a disciple, all right, is not one who's the Lord or the master over the one that's being discipled. The disciple is one who's actively pursuing Christ. And they become a disciple when they grab another person alongside and say, let's do this together. It is really a movement where disciples are reaching out to other people and saying, walk with me as I walk as a disciple. And guess what? Together we'll be disciples in Christ. And it, and it changes the, uh, the, the nature of uh, the relationship. If you, if you understand that you're there to serve and accompany young people, to guide them and to uh, help them overcome the obstacles that are on their path. And Sarah mentioned some of them, just the worldliness, social media, all the distractions and noise of this world that seeks to rob a young person's ability to find peace and center their lives on Christ for a time of meaningful prayer. It's an art. It's a skill. It's a, it's a gift that needs to be passed on in the context of a relationship with that team. And, you know, I, if you look at the model Christ gave, right, he, he didn't go out and create a thousand disciples. He, he created 12 apostles, and out of those 12, he had a very intimate relationship with Peter, James, and John. And he trained these guys, and he got them rooted in prayer, and filled them with the Holy Spirit, and empowered them to go out and do the same in the lives of a few other people. You know, and, and, and as you see uh, you know, this happening, uh, where we take time to invest in a handful of young people within our group and really disciple them, we will have more of an impact on the church by discipling a handful of young people very well than serving a hundred young people, but not really being able to take them very deep. And we see this borne out in the statistics of our church today. And, you know, it saddens my heart, but the reality is, is we look out across a room that may have 3,000 young people worshiping Jesus and just on fire for faith, in their faith in this moment, that more than half of them are going to be non-practicing Catholics people who do college. That's that's heartbreaking. And these young people are being called by Christ into the ultimate relationship. And yet, as soon as they accept Christ, they're actually stepping into a life of battle and challenge. And we really need to be a, do a much better job as a church of really teaching them how to walk with Christ on a, on a, on a commitment to ongoing conversion. You know, the, the, I, I talked about the first three phases, and I kind of want to transition to the next four, because this is really where you're going to pick up the mantle coming out of a conference. And you're really going to walk with young people at, in these different stages. You know, I, the, the next stage after they make their initial conversion is that's when we start the process of heavy catechesis. And, and I think we kind of sometimes get it wrong in the church. We keep trying to pile catechesis upon young people and think catechesis will make you a better Catholic. Catechesis will make you a stronger Catholic. And I would say, unless there's a place in their heart that loves Jesus and wants to know that truth about Jesus, all the other truths that we teach as a church don't really have a landing place yet. Now, I'm not saying that you won't plant a seed to that kind of catechesis that might reap fruit, may reap fruit in the future, but ideally what we want to do is to lead young people to that initial conversion. And this is why I think the studio conferences are a, good, are a gift to the church because we do that well. And when they leave, the, the, you know, the, the, the feedback I get from so many youth ministers is like, this kid used to go nowhere, and he'd come to youth group and just sit on his hands, and he was disinterested, and then he went to studio, and God did something in his life, and now he's at everything. He's asking questions, and he's growing, and he's praying, and he wants more. He's, he's hungry for more. So I think it, that, that encounter with Christ's love sparks a deeper hunger. And the catechesis, you know, has to do with just 
in, in, in enhancing their life with relevant truths. Like this is how you live the life of a young Catholic in this time in, in, in history. You know, I think uh, you know standard catechesis. You know, we, there's there's literally an endless supply of catechesis that our church has. We could literally spend the next hundred years of our lives reading book after book after book, learning more and more about our faith. But the catechesis that they need right now is what are, what are they dealing with in their lives? You know, and as Sarah alluded to, it's like, well, how do we teach them to pray? Because if the fundamental building block of a life of, event, of, of discipleship is a relationship with Christ, then that's where we should start teaching them how to have a relationship with Christ. And that as Christ taught us in the Apostle John and his epistle affirmed that if we say we love God but hate our neighbor, we're a hypocrite, then the other thing that youth group should be teaching is the proper nature of love between people. You know, I would say that for catechesis, make your youth group a school of love. Teach them how to love God. Teach them how to love one another. Talk about what love is because it's not being talked about in any good way in our society today. Love has been kicked around, dragged through the dirt. It's had mud thrown on it. It has been so twisted in the eyes of young people that they don't even know if they believe in love anymore. And it's essential to our hope. It's essential to our identity as a Christian that we have a firm belief and understanding of what love is. So the catechesis coming out of school is take that fervor, that love that they've experienced and build upon it with this is how we build a community of love. This, this is what true love is between friends, between people who date, between parents and children, between, you know, the, the relationship you have with teachers. Everything should be taught. This is how you love one another as Christ loves us. And this and through that, we're going to be loving God. And because until we, once, once again, create schools of love, you know, all the other catechesis will, will, will kind of come up short, especially for kids who are just starting to know what it means to love God. And how do I love God? You know, and, and, and as you grow, there's it, obviously we want to teach them how to be good Catholics and, and reveal the beauty of truth. That's things like the Eucharist uh, and, and, uh, and other uh, beautiful uh, symbols and signs in our church of God's love. So when you come to the Eucharist to help them understand that that is the reception of Christ's love in the sacramental form. You, know, it, 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 you have to bring in all aspects, but it needs to be taught from a framework of what is love. You know, um, it was Pope, I said, well, now St. John Paul the Great, who talked about the family and familiarity and sort of as a school of love. And in my last youth group, I mean, half my kids didn't even have intact families. You know, half the kids in my youth group weren't being taught what love was between a man and a woman and what laying down your life for another person looked like in their home. It was, it was, you know, under, undermined by divorce and separation and oftentimes rejection and, and, and abandonment. And, and so it's so important that we create these schools of love in, in, in catechesis. Sarah, you got anything you want to add on catechesis? Um, not necessarily catechesis, but I did have two thoughts as you were talking. Um, just two things to help them see on their journey as um, we've been working on developing a lead program and, and how to help them in this daily walk. Um, of just that idea of um, how to serve the Lord in the little things every day. And um, in, like I said, in the life of prayer, but what, you know, it's not about this big um, crazy experience of going out and serving the Lord or um, spreading their witness to tons of people, but like in the day in and day out, um, offering things, little things to the Lord, doing things for the love of the Lord. And um, even in their gifts and their talents and their sports and things that they're doing, that everything that they can do can glorify him. And um, the other thing too, that we've been talking a lot about is that idea of them, struggling with the double life and so in walking with them um you know kind of in that between the initial conversion we talked about in this catechesis like not having one foot in you know their relationship with Christ and then their one foot in the world so and I think um catechesis and teaching of the faith can can help this and can help in that you know to take deeper root in their life but to um to help them realize that too that um it's the everyday it's not just about knowledge but also of just doing everything that they do, uh, their schoolwork, everything for the glory of the Lord and, and not that double life. So I backtracked just a little, but those are two things I thought of when you were talking about just even before catechesis. Um, and then, you know, the catechesis can help uh, supplement that and, and give them more knowledge uh, to grow in that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and like I said, it all goes back to number one, helping them fulfill the greatest commandment of loving God with their whole hearts and whole mind and whole strength. And, 
And secondly, just loving their neighbor like themselves. And I have a son who's 21 years old, and, and all through high school, you know, I languish with whether or not all the things that I was trying to instill in him is in godly character and, and, and being a man of God was going to take root. You know, at age 18, I had this radical conversion, and I was determined that I was going to help my son avoid all the pitfalls I landed in in high school and, and rise above it as a young man. And he did not make it through high school without his struggles. He had his challenges, and he, you know, it was he, he grew like everyone else had to grow. grow. And, uh, you know, when I had my conversion at 18, I uh, went and joined uh, and served with Ned as a missionary, spreading the gospel. And, you know, as a father, you know, I was like, oh, let me my children follow in my footsteps. And, uh, you know, none of my children have. So I'm like, am I? Well, my son spends every one of his Friday nights with a group of guys here at Francis University praying in front of uh, strip clubs across the river in Weird, West Virginia. And witnessing of the gospel to the people there who would want to degrade and dehumanize and objectify women. And I didn't push him to that. I didn't recommend him do that. I, I, I don't, I did, he did it for months before he even told me he was doing it. You know, I mean, I, and when he told me, I was just so proud. You know, I think as we walk with young people in discipleship, even our own children, you know, I mean, like, there is a way that what God is doing. You know, as long as you continue to be that constant witness of love in their lives through your ministry, it will have a transformative effect. You know, one of the things, though, that, that has been very clear with my children and helping them grow and also in the young people that I've served in youth ministry is there needs to be a level of leading them to a, a phase called adherence in the faith. So we talked about witness. We talked about proclamation. We talked about taking them to a point of catechesis. And after catechesis, we really need to teach young people how to make this faith stick. So, you know, the, the, the stage is called that here, but I would say we want to give young people sticky faith, faith that clings to them, that they own, that is a part of them now, that, that doesn't fall off. And adhering to Christ means two things. Number one, it means teaching them how to renounce the world, how to say no to sin and things that aren't of God. And I think as long as we continue to teach them how to say yes to Christ, but not how to say no to things that would pull them away from Christ, we're only giving them half the message, and we're not setting them up to the greatest level of success. Adherence to Christ means rejecting the world. You know, Jesus himself said, you can't have two masters. You either love one and hate the other. And, and, G and Sarah alluded this too. This is what we're trying to teach and lead is don't have a double. Don't have a, a one area of your life that is under the lordship of Christ and another part where you just live it for yourself. Like we need to be integrated. Faith needs to be integrated into everything. And we need to reject those things and live a, away from those things. And that's on us, too, to be our witness. Because I know a lot of adults who still struggle with sins who haven't learned how to say goodbye to their sin. And I'm not talking about the little sins that we all struggle with, even, but major sins in their life. Addictions to pornography and different substances. You know, sinful lifestyle choices that they're just not willing to let go of. And until we have complete lordship in our lives, you know, it, it's going to be hard for us to witness that to young people. But this phase of teaching them how to, number two, not only just say no to Christ, but then when they empty themselves of these things, how to live, help them live a life in the Holy Spirit. How to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that the, the Holy Spirit becomes the interior master and the illuminating factor in their life so that through the power of the Holy Spirit, they can see themselves rightly. They can see what God is calling them to do. They can see where they need to grow. And they are no longer, uh, you know, living a faith that is uh, riding your co coattails or their parents' coattails, but they're really living their own faith. And in that, I'll just be honest, they're going to fail a lot as they're learning to do this. It's like the baby's learning to walk. And I, and I think, you know, when we see a baby learning to walk and they fall either, you know, flat on their face or they just kind of collapse onto their bottom and they look up. You know, I don't know any parents who, when their babies fall, walk over to them and smack them in the head and say, you stupid baby, learn how to walk. I'm, I'm trying to teach you. Learn how to walk and shake the baby to walk. You know, we, 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 we hug the baby. We pick the baby up. It's going to be okay. You can do this. We put them back on their feet and we say, go for it. They take two steps and fall. We have them back up. You can do it. And eventually, these babies learn to walk. And it's, it, it'd be more, it'd probably serve us all well to remember that as we work with young people. I know I need to be reminded of 
this. They may have facial hair and tattoos and and piercings that kind of like, oh my gosh, what is that? That's an interest. That's a life choice, and that's a good look. You know, that that's a look. Uh, but really, they're, they're they're God's children, trying to learn how to walk with Christ, and we need to be constantly lifting them up when they fall and helping them stay walking with the with Christ in this this phase of of adherence. You know, once we get them to own their faith, then we can get into stage six of this, this kind of progression, which is to help form them as disciples. All right? You know, oftentimes, you know, we try too quickly to try to form people into something that they're not ready to be. Because unless a young person's heart is open to Christ and they've experienced that love of Christ, unless they have made a decision to follow Christ and have actually started to own their faith on some level, to try to steer them, guide them, or mold them into something, is going to be, it's like, it's too early to do that. Um, you know, as a sculptor, you know, the first thing that you have to do is you've got to get the right ball of clay and you have to make it the right uh, level of wetness to put it on the wheel and start forming it and shaping it to whatever you want it to be. And young people in the same way, it takes a while for them to get there. I don't think we need to rush this process. And understanding that if you have four years with a young person, they might just start to become a disciple that you can form when they're a senior in high school. It's, it takes longer. There's no, there's no set thing that says, okay, if I do stage one and do this, and then everyone's going to progress at the same level. But we can get young people to the point where we start to form them. And that means continuing education and formation in prayer. You know, I, I often say when we're teaching young people to pray, teach them how to spend five minutes in prayer. And once they've mastered five minutes of prayer, teach them how to do ten. But as we teach them how to be disciples, we can teach them how to pray more and more frequently. We can teach them how to have set times of prayer. We can teach them how to pray always, as St. Paul encourages us to do. We can teach them how to pray with the scriptures. We can teach them so many things. And all these things will come into play as they continue to progress. And we can continue to form them, uh, you know, within the context of community. This is key. Because none of us, although we have this personal relationship with Christ, it's best expressed and experienced in the context of community when we are with one another and loving one another. Because it's, like I said, it's easy for me to sit in my room alone and go, Jesus, I love you. You're so amazing. You're so wonderful. I thank you for your love. It's a very different experience for me to walk into a group of people and love them the way Jesus challenges me and calls me to love them. I have to die to myself in those moments. I can express my love to God with very little self-denial. To love other people, that's when I'm going to really learn what it means to take up the cross. And I do that as a father, I do that as a co-worker, I do that within groups that I gather with to, to pray and to share my faith with and be held accountable with. You know what I mean? And this is what the, the goal of youth ministry is, is to create that environment where these things are happening in the lives of young people. And finally, you know, after you've had a chance to, to build up a young person, ultimately our goal is to send them forth. In the last phase, the last phase of walking with teens and discipleship is to get them ready to go and do something, you know, and to give them some sort of missionary initiative. You know, the ultimate expression of being a disciple of Christ is then going forward and making other disciples. And that happens after a time of formation. So like, okay, one week we're going to make, you know, we're going to come back from Steubenville, and the next week everyone's going to go out and evangelize somebody. Now, that's an unrealistic expectation. They need to be formed and built up and sent forth with that. But that should be our goal. Our goal is to it should be able to look at young people and get them to be uh, uh, assuming a, a, a role of mission within the church, building it up in some way, whether that be service of the poor, whether that be catechetical ministry, whether that be helping. In my last ministry position before I came back to the university to work here, I had a group of amazing, I mean, I had 15 of these amazing high school students that together, and they were friends before, and they kind of all went through this conversion together. It was really weird. Like, all of a sudden, this, they had this tight-knit Christian community, and they were saying no to the world, that they were, they were really banding together, and they were really strengthening one another to walk with the Lord, and they were getting rejected at school because of it, and being made fun of. And after a while, though, they started to get restless, like, Okay, what is the point of us doing all this? If it's just so we can hug together and say, okay, let's just protect one another and form a little cocoon. And I realized at that moment that they were ready for missionary activity. 
they had grown enough in their faith. And by the time they were juniors in high school, and this was after almost two years of working with them in small group discipleship and then working them and you know, bringing them to a couple of student book conferences, that I was able to form a, a youth core team in my youth group. And these young people would come to senior high youth group on one night and help go and lead the junior high youth group on, the other, on, on another night of the week. And they became the core of, of the leadership of my junior high ministry. And, and, and this is what we see happening. This is what we need to see, see, see more happen. You know, the, you know, when young people are brought into that faith that adheres, that, that they're really taught how to say no to the world and yes to Christ in challenging circumstances, when they face their first set of challenging circumstances, and it usually happens within the first week of stepping onto a college campus, their faith gets picked off by Satan or trampled by the world around them or choked off by the sin that they fall into. And we see too many, way too many young adults falling, into the, falling back into the world and, and becoming disconnected for, from church, and many of them are never finding their way back. And so it's essential that you as a minister of the church, in, in whatever capacity God has called you to serve, that we be active about making these young people into disciples that are strong and courageous and have learned enough about themselves and have experienced enough victory in their life through prayer and through growing in their faith, that when they leave your group, they're not going to fall apart. They're going to be stronger and a witness when they go to these campuses. This should be our end game. You, you should look at every young person who walks into your youth group and say, my goal for you is to send you forth as a disciple to change the world. That's what I want to do in your life. Because that is what we're called to do as church. And if our youth groups are not designed to do that, then I think we're falling short in the mission of what youth ministry is supposed to do. And once again, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. This is, this is hard work. It is. It has to be covered in a ton of prayer. This is why we have to be praying for ourselves and having our own relationship with Christ. We need to be praying with our core team members and other people that we serve with. we got to be praying with the teens because if the Holy Spirit's not saturating every part of this effort, it will fail. Because ultimately the conversion we seek to see in young people's lives is a gift of the Holy Spirit and not just our efforts. And our efforts are essential, but they'll never be enough to create the kind of disciples that we want to see being formed within our youth groups. So that's, you know, I think one of the cool things, and I want to let Sarah go, that we've done is we've created a program that can help you get some of your teens on the discipleship path. And I'm just going to turn it over to Sarah. And she's going to speak more about this now. So Sarah, take it away. Sure. So I've mentioned that a couple times, and uh, maybe some of you know already know about this program, but um, Franciscan Lead is a week-long discipleship leadership week before all of our youth conferences. And... Um, the foundation and principle behind uh, this program was to really um, put teens in relationship with Christ um, to emphasize the fact that the Lord wants to love them more than he wants to use them. And the core, one of the heart core messages of um, Franciscan Lead is the life of daily prayer that we've been talking about. Uh, every morning, speaking about prayer and setting them off for 30 minutes of personal prayer time. Again, um, before we even start talking about witness and evangelization and leadership, really emphasizing their need to be a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and all of the evening sessions are focused on that encounter, coming to know him more and, and uh, responding to his love and worship, to encounter him in Eucharistic adoration, to experience his mercy and confession. Um, again, really fostering that relationship. Uh, we have men's and women's sessions and opportunities for them to grow um, an understanding of their identity as men and women and living in a life of virtue and chastity. Um, again, at the foundation and core of, of who they are. And then once that foundation is set and throughout the week, we do give them tools and equip them to, um, as John was talking about in the missionary uh, stage of discipleship, to, to make disciples themselves. We teach them how to give a three-minute witness, which is one of my favorite parts about the week. We ask them to sit and think and pray about what they want to share of how God has worked in their life. And a key thing for their faith to stay rooted even after high school is for them to be able to articulate what God has done. We see that to be a correlation those that um, those teens that are able to experience and encounter Christ, but then to articulate uh, how he's worked in their life, um, their faith has taken even uh, deeper root um, and is uh, it's harder to shake. Um, so it's uh, beautiful for them to sit and think. Some of them struggle with it, but to sit and think about how God 
um, has worked in their life and then to be able to share it uh, with them, uh, the teens on the week, and then with their youth group when they go home and people they encounter in their life. Uh, we talk a lot about servant leadership and humility um, as being foundations uh, for all of that. So. Uh, the LEAD program um, really is a benefit to you and to your youth group as well. Again, all of these teams have uh, conversion experiences on LEAD, uh, grow closer to Christ, but also we send them off to serve their youth group, uh, particularly on the weekend. We emphasize to them that they've had this incredible encounter, but they're not supposed to stay there. To go out and maybe reach out to those that came with you on the weekend that don't want to be there or don't really know what's going on, uh, to just befriend them and not even necessarily tell their story, but to just... I'll walk with them and be with them and, and make friends with them, uh, possibly share their witness on the week and to really serve you and ask you, how can they help? Um, possibly they might be able to co-lead a small group with one of your adult chaperones, um, again, to foster that community and to share their witness. And then even going forth from uh, the weekend to serve your youth group. I know tons of youth ministers that have uh, really um, utilized their teens who have gone to lead to build up their youth group and to uh, yeah, so just reach out to those that, you know, might be on the fringe or uh, want to bring them in deeper. So I would encourage all of you, if you haven't um, sent teens to lead, uh, it would be a beautiful um, experience for them and also a great benefit to you and your youth group. Um, and there's lots of information about the program on our website. Uh, so feel free to check that out as well. So. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, the student conferences, who do we serve? Uh, we serve you. I mean, we can evangelize kids every summer, and we do. We've already got 48,000 teens coming to conferences this summer at this point signed up already. And by the time it's all over and done, we're going to have over 50,000. And it would you know, be great to say, oh, that's such a great, it is a great thing, and God is moving. But really, the strength of our ministry, it lies in the end in the hands of people like yourselves and what you're going to do when you get back to the parish to build upon this. This, this, this conversion of the experience is not the end. It's, this is the beginning of discipleship. And so we stand in humble appreciation of all your efforts to evangelize and know that, you know, if you don't bring teens, we can't evangelize them. If we don't evangelize them well, they might not be ready for discipleships. We really want to partner with you. And as a result, you know, we've been very, um, very uh, purposeful in our office about helping uh, people grow as a disciple after our conferences. Last year, we created a set of 30 videos for young people, and you can still find them on our website at, at Be a Disciple. We also created 30 videos for adults to help both adults and teens on their discipleship journey, and that's on our Studentville Fuel website. Fuel was developed this fall and launched with the goal of helping people grow in their faith all year round by providing resources that can help keep the fire burning. We know that for most of you, we're one week in, out of the year in the life of your youth ministry. And there's so much more that you're doing uh, for them than we are. But we're just glad to be able to partner with you for that one weekend to be able to provide an opportunity and create an environment where your young people can, can encounter Christ's love and be transformed by that encounter. You know, and as you go out in discipleship, you know, it's so important. You know, I, I, probably the best analogy, I think, of, of a disciple is, you know, I want to set a young person on fire. This is what I have to do. I got to make sure that my own heart is burning bright with the love of Jesus. Then I got to draw that young person close to myself and be in a relationship with them. If I draw them close enough to my own heart, they're going to catch on fire. And I have, that means I have to be praying. I have to be going to the sacraments on a regular basis and, 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 and praying daily and, 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 and immersing my life in truth and avoiding sin. These are, the, these, these are the calls of a disciple to love and to live and to follow. Um, and you know, if, we, if, we, if you become that person, you will not just be a youth minister or a chaperone or a group leader. You'll become a hero because you will have a lasting impact. And you'll never know where it's going to come. Uh, one last story I want to share is I had um, uh, you know, a, an opportunity uh, when I was youth minister. We, I had a membership that was paid for uh, by a family at one of the local pools, you know, which was nice because I couldn't afford it on a youth minister's salary. But I was there with my family one afternoon, and one of the guys from the youth group, Greg, I love this kid, and he was a wild man, but uh, just had, you know, just a, a, a passion for life, and always had a, a witty answer for any stupid question I'd throw his way. It was just, it was just a lot of fun to do this. So he sat down at this table next to the boy, and I was 
and so my wife, and we started talking, and we really didn't we were talking about anything. So I just, it was August. He was getting ready to go back to school in a couple of weeks. I said, I said what, 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 are, what are your plans for this fall? What are you going to do? He goes, well, we just started football practice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be the captain of the football team. Well, that's awesome. You know, why do you want to be captain? Well, I, I want to go out there and I want to I want to tackle and I want to hit and I want to I want to score touchdowns. I want to do whatever I can to to just have the best football season ever. You know, and 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 I and I, and I want to be and I want to be this guy who's just people know that I've had this passion for football. I said oh, that's, that's cool. You know, because he he was he was a great football player. And so what else? He goes, well, I'm, I'm I've signed up to take guitar lessons because I want to learn how to play guitar as well. I said, well, that is so amazing. And like, I, you know, I, I love playing guitar myself. I'm like, that's so cool. You know, when, and I, so we started talking about kind of lessons he was taking. And, you know, I asked him, well, what else? He was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting really involved with school, with the student government, and uh, I have a shot at National Honor Society, so I'm going to keep my GPA up so I can get into the National Honor Society. And, you know, I just listened. I said, well, every time he said something, I said, oh, that's really cool. And uh, finally, after listening to him, I just asked him a question. And I think I might have, I probably said a short prayer because this question didn't come from me. But, you know, I just said, hey, you've got so many great things going on. What is your plan for God this fall? And what are you going to do to amaze God? And he just felt silenced. And he didn't answer my question. He just quickly changed the subject and then as quickly as he could walked away. And I, and I sat there thinking, gosh, you know, what did I do? Did I offend him and make him mad? And uh, I hope I, I hope I hadn't blown it, you know, because I, I didn't want this, to cut this kid off and thinking that I'm just going to be on him. And he came back to me a couple of weeks later as we were getting ready to launch youth group. He says, he says, I'm mad at you. I've been mad at you for two weeks. I'm like, well, what did I do? He says, like, you asked me that question. I said, so? I mean, it's just a question. It's no big deal. He's like, I haven't been able to get that question out of my mind. I go to bed at night and that question's echoing in my ears. I wake up in the morning and I want to, you know, <laughs> you know I, I feel like God is not going to let me forget that question until I have an answer for him. What am I going to do right now to amaze God? And he goes, help me. I want to do something amazing for God. And it was that one question that got this kid off the fence with God and just hungry for more and he was open he, he expressed a personal openness to be discipled and that's how i knew he was ready for discipleship and he'd already made a commitment to christ but just not really a, you know i'm not gonna go too far i want enough jesus in my life not to feel bad but not enough jesus to go crazy and make my life too chaotic just that, that you know three dollars worth of god you know that i can slip into my wallet and it doesn't take up too much space kind of attitude and, uh, and this kid went on to be one of the greatest leaders in my youth group and still has a strong faith and is active in his church today. And, 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 and look, you, you, like, how do I do this? When will I know? How, how, how will God send me the right person to disciple? How do I know out of 50 kids in my youth group which are ready for discipleship? Very simple. You pray and you let the Holy Spirit show you. We can't bring people to discipleship. The Holy Spirit's got to do that. So this is why I say immerse all this discipleship effort in prayer. And trusting God, he's going to raise up the leaders in your youth group. If you say, God, I don't have any teens to disciple, it's kind of like what they said to Mary at the wedding of Canaan. We have no line. It wasn't a specific request. It was just an observation. So if you're sitting in, as a youth minister saying, I don't know who to disciple. I don't have any disciples. Offer that, you know, that, that statement up as a prayer and let God do something miraculous to solve your problem. You know, Jesus showed up. Jesus, at Mary's request, turn, you know, the water into wine for them, and not just cheap wine, the best of wine. So don't look to make this happen. Trust that God's going to raise up what you need to have happen in his divine plan. But be asking God in prayer, God, I don't have disciples in my youth group. And boom, you'd be surprised how God's going to fulfill that desire. And he's going to equip you to disciple. He will give you every spiritual and temporal gift you need to do this because it is his mission to do discipleship in you and through you to bless the church and to help it grow. And we are here, we are hemorrhaging faith as you're in here. How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to his children who ask? I mean, that's, Jesus is there for us. And I, I just don't want anyone to feel like, oh, this seems so overwhelming. How can I do it? We all can do it. We're all called to do it. And we will all be equipped by the Holy Spirit to do it and make ourselves available to do it. And, and I have the faith to know that there's nobody listening to this 
who isn't going to be equipped to do amazing things in discipleship with young people in their ministry. So, Sarah, do you have any final thoughts as we wrap up here? Mm-hmm. I, we did get one question, if you don't mind. I'm just going to answer that real quick, and then I do have a couple final thoughts. So our question was, um, how many teens do you take for lead? And that's a great question. And um, I would encourage, so Franciscan Lead is an application process. And so we have the teens apply. That link is on our website. I would encourage you to um, think of three to four teens. Um, And if you don't have three to four, that's okay too. But it's nice to send a few teens uh, together so that when they come home from Lead, um, they've had that experience together and, you know, have that mini community within your youth group of support because they had the same experience. Um, and we will take as many as we can, um, you know, if they have our strong applicants and, and all of that um, until we fill our max capacity. So unfortunately, I can't give you an exact number. It just depends on how many teens apply every summer and we take into account our desire to serve as many parishes as possible. So, um, you know, if we have a ton of applicants, you may be only be able to accept two from your parish or we might be able to accept six or seven. It, um, every year it's kind of different depending on the number of applicants. But I would encourage you to think of three or four. I think that's a good number to apply um, just with letting them know, you know, it's an application process, um, you know, but I would encourage you to apply, um, but not committing 100% that they'll be able to, to be accepted this year, but encouraging um, them to apply. And if for some reason we had to place teens on a wait list, we really look at that for the next year. So again, three to four, but the numbers vary. So I hope that helps answer your question um, on that. So, um, uh, we'll stay on. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Any guys final thoughts? And but I just want to quickly say, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question tab, hit enter, and they'll pop up on our screens. We'll, any questions you have about discipleship, the conferences, or any, any anything that we can serve you in, just feel free to, uh, to to enter your input now. Go ahead, Sarah. And my final thought um, was very similar to John's of just encouragement. Um, I know there have been many times um, in my life where, especially here on campus, I've been blessed. I'm not with youth uh, teens, but I get to work with some college students here on campus and um, just have had a desire to uh, walk more closely with a few um, and to kind of speak to what John has said. Um, that has happened. I've had a few girls reach out to me to want to meet with me one-on-one and things like that. And it wasn't anything that I elicited. I, they knew I was available. Again, with the relationship, I work with a group of girls here on campus um, because I knew I was there for them and because they knew that I truly loved them. Um, they were uh, trusting and courageous enough to reach out to me and ask if they could get together one-on-one and have coffee. And we've had some really beautiful conversations. Um, so again, that relationship of uh, love and trust will really set the tone uh, for them to be able to reach out to you and for the Lord to really send those teens in your path. I've seen it in my own life. Um, and again, I'm sometimes nervous. I'm not sure what, what will I say or what are they going to want to talk about? I don't know if I'm going to have the wisdom, but uh, that's me relying on myself. Um, and again, like John said, just that prayer to the Holy Spirit of just use me, um, use me in my excuse me in my experience um, and just help me to, to say what you want to say through me. Um, I've seen it in my own life. Again, nothing to my own credit or to my own ability, but I've seen the Holy Spirit work in and through those conversations and opportunities. So to be encouraged, um, the Lord, as John said, will bless that and your desire um, because the Lord wants to use you. So that's all. Great. Um, Good. I got another question. And one of the questions uh, that's popped up, are there any other practical things that you've heard or seen done that work well for follow-up after the case? And, and this is a, a great question. You know, there are many approaches to ministry afterwards, but when we talk about the fundamentals, I would say, you know, set a time for uh, for everyone who's gone to Studentville to gather every week if possible, if not every other week, and do a holy hour together. It might not be at a time where the Blessed, uh, Blessed Sacrament is actually exposed in a monstrance, but just praying before the tabernacle. You know, I think. Oftentimes, there's a hunger for ministry at parishes, but parishes, you know, um, we serve a lot of uh, we serve a lot of people who's, who the civil conference is almost all they do. It's like the one thing they do. They're not really coming from a parish with the youth minister. So we get this question a lot. Number one, gather the young people to pray and ask God for what you want to see happen. If you want to see your ministry strengthened, gather these young people together and have them start to pray together. Um, Number two, you know, we created a resource last year, which was a Bible study based on the fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, where uh, you can take this back because we did a, a workshop and you need to pray it on Sunday morning in a particular way for different fruits of the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And it was a way of following it up. And right now, my team is developing a resource that's going to be available online in June where, where you can have a package that you can download uh, that will include videos and, uh, and different things uh, for following up the conference. And some of it will go online in June. Others will go online in August. But it will be available to help groups who come out of student group. But the most important thing that you can do to keep the fire burning is gather the kids together and pray. Number two, get the kids to go to confession on a regular basis together. As long as they, you know, it's like God wants to pour you, you know, the hearts, his, his love to young people, but the sin can block it. So when you go to confession, the block is removed, and these kids are staying in communion with Christ. And a lot of times, their parents are not encouraging them to receive the sacrament, not even during Holy Week, like Lent, or even during Advent. So there, there's really no one encouraging them to come close. And at a single conference on a, on a typical weekend, anywhere from a thousand to two thousand kids will receive confession and, and will see that mercy and grace. And, and that's what opens the door for a lot of this conversion to take place. So get them frequently in the, in the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, there's a lot of resources. You can, there's a a great resource called Why Disciple that can really help if you're interested in launching a discipleship ministry. So the letter Y, the word disciple, Google it, it will take you to their site. You can learn more about what they provide. Uh, Life Team has some great resources for uh, developing discipleship groups. Uh, and, and we're actually working with them to create a set of, uh, a, a, a set of tools that um, can be used by youth ministry, parishes that don't have a full-time youth ministry that just want resources to help form a small faith community. Um, you know, another thing is just, you know, read the Bible together. You know, and like, I assigned one of the kids in my youth group to do this. He, his job was to every day was to text a piece of scripture to everyone else in the youth group, you know, so that every day everyone in the youth group was receiving a scripture and anyone could sign up, and he would add them to the list. And, they'd all read. and then on Sunday, when we would gather, we'd talk about the scriptures. You know, um, even if you don't have a formal youth ministry, gather young people together and talk about the Sunday readings before Sunday. You know, like start a Wednesday night warm up call. It you know, just gather young people together, pull out the gospel for the upcoming Sunday, and talk about it. And how does it apply to, to the life of a young person? You know, they're they are for all the. All the negative things that are said about this young generation, they're extremely spiritually hungry. They're extremely relationally starving. And anything that you do to help gather them together and build them up in their faith is going to be received. And they might not actually show it on the outside because they are they do a very good job of hiding their true selves. Even when you're with them, they're sometimes you know, people can be hard to read. But don't give up. Draw them together. Talk with them. Um, you know, If you are looking to build relationships, Spend time, you know, in, in, in building a relationship one on one with them. You know, I mean, I know a lot of guys who have the policy where you can't meet a car with the person, so you probably have to meet somewhere, but meet somewhere in a public place and, and, and just spend time over a basket of fries and coke talking about their lives. If you spend 20 minutes of quality time talking to a high school student about their lives and what's going on, sadly to say, you'll probably have spent more time than most of their parents have that week invest in that kind of effort and attention to them. That breaks my heart to think about that, but yeah, unfortunately that's where they come from. Sarah, what other ideas would you uh, want to re recommend? Yeah, um, possibly, you know, um, to get them together again, and uh, maybe a service project, and you may have thought of that, but an opportunity for them to put uh, that love that they experienced in action, uh, one would bring them back together, and also to just for them to be able to uh, give what they've received um, in some capacity. And I always come back to, and I mentioned it earlier, um, having them share their witnesses for the group. I remember, because we do it on lead, I, I remember reading something from Pope Francis just about how our memory inspires hope. And so we uh, remember what God has done. Not that we're supposed to stay there. We're supposed to be moving forward. But if they can remember what God had done on the weekend, um, it will offer them hope. Um, so I think that's a wonderful activity is to get them together together. A little bit later, when it's not as fresh for them to share, um, to remember, um, to be offered that hope. But like John said too, and one on one, um, I haven't, uh, I have never been a group leader actually to youth conference. But if I if I was and uh, was bringing teams, I would really want to have someone, whether it not be me, but maybe my core team, to 
have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them too, because everyone's journey is different. Everyone's experience is different. So all of these things that we can do as a group are wonderful and super important. Um, but every single teen's walk with Christ and path is going to look a little bit different, different struggles. And so to be able to connect with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and cater to them is huge. So that's what right. I'm at. Yeah, and then the next question, um, any practical tips on dealing with adults that come as chaperones but aren't much further in the faith than the teens are? How do we decide with the adults? Excellent question. I'll tell you, that's probably the more difficult question. I, I find now that I'm spending more time uh, discipling adults who uh, are wanting to start to live as disciples. You know, I've moved away from youth ministry, but I'm doing a lot more work with discipling adults. And the key is, once again, it, it doesn't really change. Uh, you have to form relationships. You know, when I came into my last parish, they had tried youth ministry twice and it had failed miserably. The person that they hired wasn't the right person. There were some really weak attempts. When everyone, when I showed up, everyone was gun shy, like, okay, do we have another joker? Or, you know, what is this program going to be like? The other ones where it's around for six months and the person quits or gets fired. And, and, and the adults were the same way, like, oh, I don't know if I want to commit to, um, to this, you know, because I've committed before and, it's, and the bottom's dropped out. And um, I realized very quickly, you know, when I went to this parish, that there weren't a lot of active ministries developing lifelong disciples and doing a lot of good work in discipling fellow adults. You know, there were Bible studies and you know, there were a few prayer groups. There, the, the, the parish, of course, wasn't void of, of uh disciples, but to those that were formed well enough to get involved in missionary activity, I would say it, it, it was a, a tremendous weakness. And so what I did is already, I, I joined myself to ministries that were already intentionally trying to build up disciples and got to know people within those ministries and asked God to open up doors. And when it kind of became clear that I needed to invite this person to join in the youth ministry, I knew that I wasn't taking them on just as a core team or, or a chaperone, but as somebody that I was going to disciple. You know, I spent half my, I spent more time discipling my fellow uh, core team members and the adults I work with than the teens I work with. Why? Because if I could form 10 adults on how to disciple a team, I'd have the, I'd have created the ability to, for 50 teens to get discipled in my youth group in a year. Whereas I could only, at best, disciple five kids at a time. And so this idea of multiplying yourself, it, it is investing. Now you say, well, what's the investment if I'm just bringing them on as a chaperone for the weekend? I think, you know, the investment is you need to show them and witness your love to them and get them open to have their own encounter through the conference. I have heard so many stories about a chaperone who was like, oh, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just, I'm like the hockey goalie. If the kids come near me, I'm going to kick them back into play, you know, and I got my pads on so they don't hit me too hard. And, you know, and then they have this encounter and they see what happens in the lives of young people. They're like, I want that. I need mean, that. I'm, I'm all in. And they come back year after year after year as a chaperone in their, in their glory and in their faith. So I think adults do the same thing the teens do. They need to have that, that encounter with Christ. They need to have a living witness. They need to have catechesis. You know, we are, um, we have a number of resources available and we're creating more all the time. And there will be something much more uh, intentional coming up next year on how to form a team and bring them to student to get the most out of it. It's absolutely essential that we spend time forming the adults that we seek to bring on in, in ministry with us because they need it. If we want them to be able to help make disciples with us, then we need to be making them into disciples. And what I mean by that is accompanying them on their spiritual journey. My first year at that parish, I mean, every night of the week, practically, I had a different family having dinner with us. It would be, and, and it was interesting. I had I had two couples that came on board who had two children each. We just clearly said when we first started meeting with them, like, oh, we're done having kids. We're not open to any more life. We can't afford them. We don't want them. They, you know, it's like it's hard enough to raise two kids. And so, you know, they were and they were honest with us. They were, we're, you know, we're, yeah, we're using contraception. That's what we do. I mean, like, I know it might be a sin, but we're afraid to have more children. And after a while, just getting to know them and loving them, I, I, you know, I bought a copy of Christopher West's book, The Truth About you know, Sex and Marriage. And um, I gave it to him. I said, just do me a favor, just read this and tell me if anything clicks with you. I'd be glad to talk to you about it. And then both these couples came back and said, wow, I've never heard the church's teaching. And they saw the witness of my wife and I, who we had you know, four kids under the age of six at the time. And yet we had all this joy in our family. And they said, 
whatever we're doing, we're not doing it right. You know, it's, what, you know, and, and they made a radical choice to, you know, stop contraceptive. They both went on to have like four or five more kids by the time it was all over. And now both of them have big, beautiful families and they're living authentic, authentically Catholic lives in a way that, you know, they thought they were coming on to serve in a youth ministry program. But God said, no, I got something for you. And, you know, I was very blessed to be a part of that. But, you know, I really saw God's spirit more than anything, touching their hearts in ways that was just beautiful to see. So, you know, you, you, with, with adults that have their own faith walk and maybe at different levels of strength in it, you need to find out where they are. Have they been led to make a commitment? And just because they don't necessarily have everything they need to be the perfect core team member doesn't mean they're discarded. There's ways that you can bring them into the, the experience of students and bring them on as chaperones and prepare them for their own kind of their own transformation. You know, I, I think we need to realize that as youth ministers and people who want to lead ministry, we need to be investing in those that we want to bring on. We can't just say, hey, show up and give me what you got, especially if we know they don't have anything to give. And we, if we're not forming our leaders to be the people we need them to be, then no one else is going to do that. So, you know, take the time to get to know them, to pray with them, and to help engage them in a conversation where you're going to be a spiritual mentor for them. Because if they feel like they show up in youth group and it's just take, 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 and there's no give there, then they're going to get burned out and they're going to leave. You know, and, and if you find someone who's willing to commit, you want to treat them like heroes because they're hard to find. And the more you invest in them, the better they'll be at what you want them to do. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely essential that we do this as ministry leaders is to, to build up the adults that are with us. Uh, and we're going to produce, like I said, we're going to have a whole package. We're going to be producing more videos that will go up on our line. We created a whole section on suitable fuel for uh, youth ministers. And how do we how do we recruit and build up people who we would like to see uh, serve as chaperones at our, our, our conferences? And how, you know, to, to keep them from being just a warm body with a pulse that passed the uh, diocesan safe environment <laughs> test, you know. They, but really, they're going to help us lead young people to Christ. You know, and, uh, you know, there's, we'll have more resources, but you know, just get them into a discipleship relationship with yourself, and, and, and God will use you to do the best. All right, so there's no more questions, and we've got eight more minutes, and I'm not opposed to wrapping things up early. Um, but I'll, if you have another question, feel free to type it in right now. Um, but I just want to close by saying, uh, first and foremost, and we hope you have a blessed Holy Week. Uh, you know, it's... Um, it's always great to walk with Christ in his sufferings and his struggles. It's always great to be given a cross because there's no other pathway to heaven for us except through the cross. And if we are willing to suffer with Christ, we will enjoy eternal life with him. You know, suffering is, 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 is what life gives us. And our response is what we give to God. And it's so true that Jesus makes himself so present. So just let Christ continue to make himself present to you during this Holy Week. And we pray that you have a blessed Easter. Um, be sure to check out uh, the Studentville Conference website, studentvilleconferences.com. There you'll find uh, information about uh, you know, what, we're, what we have going on with LEAD, especially. Uh, you'll see a LEAD tab. You can go to the, to the youth page. You can learn more about the LEAD program, which both, both my older children have gone through, and it's been transformative for them. Like, I can't say enough about how awesome the LEAD program has been for my, my own young people. I have two more in high school right now. They're going to be going through it, whether they want to or not. So, um, okay, I'm just kidding. No, they, they didn't want to go through it. But, um, you know, also go to our Student Build Fuel website, see what resources we have. There. We have a lot of blogs and videos and more podcasts and stuff are going up all the time. Uh, there you'll also be asked if you haven't already to, to sign up to receive different bulletins and updates from us and information. Uh, more not only anything, but we take serious our, our, our partnership with you and our desire to work with you to build the church. And it really is our great honor to be able to serve you in this capacity. And we pray, we have a holy hour in Mass every week that we offer up uh, intentions for everyone coming, your youth, your chaperones, yourself, everyone who's involved, we are on our knees praying for you guys because we know that uh, we're all in this together. We all want to build the church. We all want to see great things happen, but uh, it, it's not easy. It's not easy to do what you do. I did it for many years. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah, thank you. And do you have any closing thoughts you want to share? I don't think so. <clears throat> great. Well, let me, let, let me close. Go ahead. What? No, you're good. 
He's got so many clothes in a front. Sarah, why don't you close us in prayer then? Is that? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God, we just pause. Um, just grateful hearts uh, for the work that you've done in us and for the work that you will continue to do and in the lives of all of the teens that we work with. Just uh, pray that, Lord, we may enter into this Holy Week more deeply and keep our eyes fixed on you. Just pray for all of those on this webinar, um, for all of the group leaders and chaperones that will be coming this summer. God, that you bless them. Give them your grace, your Holy Spirit, your wisdom, uh, that they may do your work. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, we'll leave uh, the, the webcam on here for a few minutes. If there's any other topics that you'd like to see addressed in future webinars, feel free to type those in and send them to us now. Um, we'll record those and uh, we'll put that in the rotation. We're going to be doing these. We do two or three a month now. Once the summer hits and we're in conference mode, we really can't do the webinars. But then once we get to August, we're picking it up. And, and these webinars are to help you uh, grow in your faith and help strengthen you and your desire to reach young people with the gospel. And uh, so if you have any topics or ideas or suggestions, you, know, you can either email me uh, uh, jbolu at franciscan.edu or type it into your question box right now. Hit enter and we'll be glad to uh, add it to our list and, uh, and, and plan that out for you. So once again, thank you. Have a blessed Easter and we will see you all again soon, if not, uh, but this summer, if not soon. All right. God bless. <laughs>